Hello and welcome to the inaugural Community Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Summit. My name is Samuel and I will be your MC this evening. This community summit and keynote would not be possible without the generous donations of our sponsors, who you've seen on the slides rotating up here. And up here. <laughs> uh, we would like to give a special thank you to Clearwater Credit Union our, as our lead sponsor and DJ&A Engineering for their donations to this work. Also, we would like to thank the City of Missoula, Missoula County, and the University of Montana for hosting this summit. A very special thank you to Denise and Brandy, our interpreters, for helping make this keynote presentation more accessible to all. Finally, as you've also seen on these slides, this event will be videotaped by Missoula Community Access Television as a part of its Media Assistance Grants Program to nonprofit organizations, and will both air on MCAT Channel 189 and be available on demand for future viewing. Now, without further ado, Please welcome DeShane Barnett, Director and Health Officer for, for Missoula City County Health Department. Good evening. Tuskani toja ni ionista hawe pesh wa onat kha shini wakani wa hudosh minase un pakosos ehenoja mi nuetanos mameni pti. Good evening, everybody. My name is Deshane Barnett. I'm Mandan and Rikara, two tribes from the Fort Berthold Reservation in North Dakota. As mentioned, I have the honor of serving as the director and health officer for the Missoula City County Health Department. Tonight, uh, they asked me to set the stage for our discussion and our time together tonight. And originally, so I had uh, some PowerPoint slides, which I actually still need to reference, so I want them out. But uh, I fell into a trap. I fell into a trap where I was going to share data, hard data, on the difference, the stark difference between the lives and health of BIPOC members of our Missoula community here locally when compared to our non-Hispanic white counterparts. But what that would do is contribute to the deficit narrative, that there's something wrong with people of color because they're falling short. And that's not true. The system is falling short. It is still true that Native Americans in Missoula County are six times more likely to not have health insurance. What is true, though, is that we have a system that is six times more likely to not provide insurance for Natives than non-Hispanic white counterparts. We have a system that makes it three times more likely that natives in Missoula are going to struggle with problem substance use sometime in their life. And we have a system that allows it to be twice as likely on any given day that a native person will die compared to a non-Hispanic white person. These are not problems with our community of color. These are problems with the systems that keep our community living in these conditions. And today is an opportunity for us to look at the lens of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion a little differently. To look at our neighbors here in Missoula and try to understand and see the invisible systems that are in play each and every day of our lives that contribute to inequality. In order for this work to happen, we need to show up. We need to show up and we need to have open hearts and open minds. I had the honor and the blessing to listen uh, to James speak this morning 
Uh, he did a, a workshop with uh, county and city leaders. And I like how he said it wasn't a training, it was a workshop because we have to do the work. And part of doing the work is showing up. And I would just like to thank each and every one of you for showing up to do this work. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Deshane. It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, James Whitfield. James employs a decidedly multidisciplinary approach resulting from broad-based experience as an executive in business, nonprofit, and government, including having been appointed by the White House to oversee the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. In his dual role as the Regional Director for the Pacific Northwest and a deputy in the Office of the Secretary, he split his time between Seattle and D.C. and managing staff across the nation. James has also held positions on numerous local, state, local statewide, and national boards of directors, including the founding board for Leadership Eastside, where he subsequently served as CEO for approximately 10 years and helped develop a master's degree in executive and civic leadership. James has studied healthcare policy at Harvard, is the author of the Hospital Patient Guide, just what the patient ordered and is co-founder of Nourishing Networks, a local all-volunteer anti-hunger movement. He has received numerous accolades for his public speaking, training, and civic engagement work. James has been married to his wife and business partner, Kristen Whitfield, since 1992. They have two adult children together who are, who are their undisputed pride and joy. James and Kristen are currently co-authoring a book about the B culture framework and process. Please join me in welcoming James Whitfield of B culture. All right. Good morning. Uh, good evening. All right, so my name is James. Uh, I'm co-founder of Bee Culture. My wife and, co -par and partner is uh, over here. That's Kristen Whitfield. <clears throat> and we're super excited to be here today. I feel like I'm behind the thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna so crowd you out over here. You all right? Okay. As was described, we launched an organization called Be Culture. And we call it that because we help people be the culture they wish to see. We mainly do that by helping leaders, equipping leaders to mobilize their organizations and their communities to integrate equity into their culture. A thing that I want to make sure that you understand, though, is that our work is, while it's multidisciplinary, is rooted in a couple of places. One is a thing called adaptive leadership, which comes from Harvard. It's a way of thinking about how you mobilize change in systems. The other is beloved community. Some of you may have, rec you may recognize that language. It's, it's the term that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. used to describe the end goals of his work. So when we think about issues of justice, equity, like that's what we're drawing from. We're drawing from the same sources and resources that he drew from, which means that our highest value is love. We're here to love you. We're here to love you if you disagree with me. We're here to love you no matter what your ideological background is. Like we're here to love you. We're here to talk about what it looks like to see this Jedi idea through the lens of love. Because history shows that's the thing that actually works. That's what works. So that's why we're gonna start, I think, I think we're gonna start, okay. I wanna start with a thank you to Missoula. Half my lifetime ago, 26 years ago, my wife and I were moving 
from Chicago to Seattle. We had the privilege of purchasing a small company, so we packed up our two kids. One was a three-year-old, the other was a one-year-old, and everything we owned in a U-Haul and our car on a trailer to drive across country from Chicago to Seattle. We had little kids, right, three and one, so we figured we could push them about eight hours a day. As long as we rewarded them with time in the swimming pool at the Holiday Inn at the end of the eight hours. Right? So back before, you know, things like GPS, my wife had printed out the MapQuest maps, right, to get us from one day to the next. Holiday Inn to Holiday Inn. And we just worked our way across the country, like leaving behind one life in Chicago, heading towards this unknown future in Seattle. We get to Missoula. It's the last stop. Back then, I don't know where it is now, but back then there was a Holiday Inn that had a swimming pool, right? We stopped at the end of the eight hours. We dropped the kids, like dumped the kids in the pool. We probably sat in the pool exhausted. And then we got them to bed, fed them, got them to bed, got up the next day. It's Sunday morning. It's what, seven hours and seven and a half hours drive from here to Seattle? A couple of stops along the way, right? That'll get us about eight hours, eight and a half. We're super stoked. Sunday morning. We got the kids up, we're ready to go. Put them in the car, drive out. There's a flat tire on the trailer. It's like a super special tire. It's Sunday morning. This is before the internet, right? We had to go find yellow pages. Those of you under a certain age, yellow pages were a thick book <laughs> described. It's like the internet was printed out on a piece of paper, right? <laughs> and we, phone call after phone call, we finally got in touch with someone. And the issue is like they had their phone at their shop, tire shop or, or repair shop, forwarded to their home. So that's why they picked up. And we're like, we're in Missoula, it's Sunday, there's this tire. And they're like, well, what kind of you know, trailer is it? Like, ah. I have one of those tires at the shop. Where are you? This human being left their home on Sunday morning, drove to the shop, got this tire, super unique, special tire, brought it to us, changed the tire, said that'll be like 30 bucks. I know 26 years is a long time ago, and you think that like maybe the, the like, Inflation has been so big that 30 bucks was a lot more money back then, like it was, but still, it was only 30 bucks. And it was just like, away you go. Zero trauma, right? Made our way to Seattle. So our future in Seattle, which brings us back to Missoula today, started with an act of kindness by somebody from Missoula. It's the only other time we've been here. We're so glad to be back. So we can say thank you, Missoula. <laughs> now, I tell that story for a couple of reasons, because I want to make sure you understand, when we think about Missoula, that's our only experience with this place. It's kind people doing nice things. But I want to talk about the kindness paradox. The kindness paradox. It turns out the word kind, the root word is the word kin. To be kind to someone is to treat someone as if they are your kin. The paradox in that is that too frequently when we treat some person as our kin, we sort of draw a circle around them and treat other people like not kin. Like, this person treated us kindly. 
I don't know anything about them other than the fact that they treated us kindly. They treated us like Ken. The paradox, though, is that all too frequently when we think about kindness, we draw a circle around our Ken, or sometimes people of our kind, and that's to whom we extend kindness. And then everyone else we keep at arm's length, like we defend our Ken against the other. We defend our Ken against the other. It requires doing what you're talking about here, this Jedi work, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, it requires expanding your circle of kindness. Who are you going to treat like Ken? Who are you going to treat like your relatives? Who are you going to get up in the morning on a Sunday and do a thing that's hard for you for virtually no reward just because you choose to be kind and not decide the next day that I'm not going to do that because I'm too tired. In our family, we say, like, no, no, that's your family. You get up and you do it again. That's the paradox we gotta make sure we pay attention to. That's part of what we're seeing in our community today is a lot of people defending their kin from the other. Where we gotta go is someplace different. So this talk was titled, What's Jedi Got to Do With It? this happen. So, what's Jedi got to do with love? Choosing unity is an act of love. Now let me be clear, I am not talking about love sort of as a feeling. I'm talking about as a commitment. Bless you. One of the people, I think the person who coined the phrase beloved community, he translates the word love as loyalty. Doing this work is an act of loyalty. Unity is an act of loyalty. We can do this work in a few different ways. The way we encourage you to do it is as an act of unity. Like, we want to unify the community all within the same circle of kindness. That is an act of love. It is, in fact, the only alternative. If, if you play it out, there are really only two options when it comes to people that you disagree with. Love them through the pain and work it out so that you end up on the other side together. Or decide you're not going to end up on the other side together. And when you take that to a community scale, that's not just a divorce. That's elimination. Like, if we're not going to hang in there together and figure it out, we're saying one of us has got to go. But the people of, of Missoula are already here. So we need, my wife and I, we just celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary, and we renewed our vows. We did not do that because we were teetering and wondering, hey, 
let's shore this thing up. You know what I mean? Like, let's, let's renew our vows. It's because we love each other. And we wanted to embarrass our kids. That probably had a lot to do with it. <laughs> we're 29 and 26 now who we invited to lead the ceremony, but really we told them they had to do it. Here's what I want to say. Jedi work requires a renewal of this community's vows. That we're going to be for one another, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer. That's what justice is. It is a commitment to loyalty to say, no matter what, we are in this together. So that's what, that's what love has to do with it. If we're unwilling to make that statement, I got you no matter what, even though it's hard. And let me be clear, it's always hard. If it was easy, it wouldn't be a thing. What kind of credit are we supposed to get? Because we're nice to people who are like us and agree with us all the time. We want an award for that? Congratulations! Somebody was just like you, never made you uncomfortable, and you were nice to them. That's real nice. No! <laughs> that's not even love. That's like, hey, that's entertainment, right? Like, that's, I went and saw a movie that didn't bother me at all. I enjoyed it. Loved that movie. You as a human being were like a movie to me. You entertained me. You caused me no discomfort. Love you. We need a renewal of the vow of community. We got you. We're here together. We're got, we'll be in it. We'll figure it out. So here is... Try this one more time. Here is one way of doing this love thing. We call it hosting. So let's talk about what it takes to host our spaces together. In community, just like in a party at your house, you have some people who open their homes maybe cook a little food. And if you come to our house, like we're gonna do everything we can to make sure that things are good for you. Make sure you got things that you can eat. Make sure you got music that you wanna to dance to. We wanna make sure your glass is never empty. Like we're gonna, we're gonna do all we can. <laughs> There's a stand-up comedian who's like, texting somebody, like where are you at? He's texting back, well, I'm, I'm at this bad party. Because he's standing in the corner texting. He's not helping it be a better party. Right? The quality of the party is the people at the party. And the people at the party, if they see themselves also as hosts of the party, we will have a much better party. So as we have conversations about issues related to Jedi, as we have conversations that may be difficult, one of the key things is to make sure we take a hosting stance. Bring what you have about hosp hospitality into the space and have a shared hosting. All be co-hosts of what we're trying to accomplish together. We landed on this because we did the work and distilled things that are common across all sorts of disciplines. So management theory, sociology, psychology, anthropology, like these are the things that are necessary for human beings to be able to work well together. And we use this definition. It is our collaborative commitment to building an equitable, thriving growth environment. It's collaborative. It's an act of love to say, we're going to stay in it together. We're going to commit to making the thing work. 
right? It's a collaborative commitment to building, so we're gonna work at it, an equitable, we're gonna talk more about equity in a moment, and thriving growth environment, a place where we all can grow. And then we use the letters that spell the word host as a way of reminding ourselves of the four core principles of hosting. So the H is for honorable collaboration. We will honor one another no matter how different we are. So differences are appreciated and built upon for collective progress. We're gonna honor one another in the way we collaborate. Here's the thing, it doesn't even say differences are okay. It says we're gonna appreciate them. The O, this clicker is really just not, not gonna be there for me. The O is openness to learning and adaptation. Prioritizing collectively learning from and with one another to find new ways of being and doing. We have a tendency to think that what we'll do is we'll say, I'll put that over there. Let's just agree to disagree. That's fine unless you have to get anything done. What takes more work is to say, let's agree that we are going to disagree. <laughs> it's the user, it's only the user, thank you. We're gonna agree that we're going to disagree long enough to figure out what we're going to do together. We're gonna to stay in the disagreement long enough to figure out what we're going to do together next. I don't know, John. It should, this is the machine. It should, this should work. Ah, it did. It, if you would stand right, like, <laughs> and went like on one foot, something. Sorry. The S is shared accountability. We collectively own our successes, challenges, and learnings. I was talking to the city county staff earlier today. We were like, you ever, like, all make a decision, and then six months later that decision doesn't work out, it goes badly. And somebody goes, oh, I knew it wasn't gonna work. Well, you should, should have said something six months ago. <laughs> like, if we have a shared accountability for the success of our community, it means we all have to show up with what we got. If you see something, that you are concerned isn't gonna work, you gotta say something about it. We have to create the conditions to make that possible, that's a real thing. You gotta create the conditions to make that possible. But the goal is to make sure we have, a sh we have shared accountability to make it go. Then we have tending to relationships. We actively build and deepen trusting relationships as we work together. We want to end up more bonded together as we do our work together. As we tackle the issues that DeShane talked about, we want to remember we're humans. And we want to be focused on our relationships as we engage in hard work. People, this is love in action. This is how you do love. It's not about feelings. This is how you demonstrate your loyalty to get to the other side with the other person. Is to be a co-host with them of getting it done. So hosting, our collaborative commitment to building an equitable, thriving growth environment, honorable collaboration, being open to learning, and adapting, making changes together into the future, having shared accountability to the success of that work, and making sure that we're tending to our relationships along the way. This is a way to turn love into action. All right, so, me 
this machine. What's Jedi got to do with systems? The Shane talked about systems earlier. Let's talk about what Jedi has to do with systems. All right. Let's see. Oh, that's even more exciting. Okay. That is the Whitfield family. Our daughter, Kat, and our son, James, were the three-year-old and one-year-old that we were driving around the country, driving across the country. Angela is the newest Whitfield. She married into the family, married James, about two years ago. And I want to point out, I'm not hearing the appropriate number of ahs or oohs. They're so beautiful, like I, I'm, I may be standing too far away. Thank you. Yeah, that's kind of the response that, I'm, that a dad wants, right? It's like, look at my kids. They're awesome. OK. <laughs> the reason I show this picture, in addition to just a shameless opportunity to uh, show my kids off, is because the concept of systems thinking started off with family systems. So we're going to look at this family to get an, an understanding of the way the systems work. All right. So, first thing about a system is that it is made up of the people in the system. John, I'm totally going to say maybe we need another battery. So, this particular system is made up of the four of us. That's our nuclear family. So, if you think about the system of the community, what system are you talking about? Like, who are the actual people that are in it? The people who were a part of the Whitfield's nuclear, uh, nuclear family, like, that's a very specific system we can talk about. The people who live in Missoula, that's different than the people who live and work in Missoula. Right? Like, those two things are not the same. And the people that are in the system help define the way the system works. We work with some organizations that are made up of, like, CPAs. That is a different system. Because the people in the system define the way the system works. And so that's the first part of a system. Second is the relationships among the people in the system. So in this one, we have spouse relationships and sibling relationships, mother, uh, mother-daughter relationships and father-son relationships. In our system, those relationships are different. Those are different kinds of relationships. We have uh, mother-son relationships and father-son relationships. Again, in our family, those things are different. Like when my daughter is having a bad time with a boy, I'm the guy who stays up. I stay up with her at night and eat ice cream. Like that's our, part of our relationship. Even when she was like far off, she just spent nine months in Costa Rica. Like, we're on WhatsApp, eating ice cream, talking about a boy. Because that's, that's, that's a part of our relationship. The re you can't predict the behavior of any one person or part of a system by looking at it on its own. You have to understand it in the context of its relationships. People frequently, when we go places, someplace where one of our kids is, they haven't met me and, and uh, they haven't met the parents or the sibling. When they see us, they're like, oh, it makes so much more sense now. <laughs> because when you see the relationships at play, you get a much better understanding of what's happening with any one person or any one part of a system. When you add a new person, it changes the system. That's a this system now with Angela is a different system. Old system, ring, ring, son, you want to come play pickleball with me? Sure, dad. New system, ring, ring, son, you want to come play pickleball with me? Nah, dad. Nah, me and Angela are doing something else. What are you doing? Uh, you know, sitting on the couch, whatever. Like, I'm doing it with her, though, not with you. That's the thing. <laughs> different system. Functions differently. Am I bitter? No, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm okay. We love Angela. <laughs> okay. So, when you're thinking about systems, you can think about it as three different parts. You have, the, you have the boundary of the system, 
that's the people in it. You have the relationships among the people in it. And then you have rules. So, when they were little, we had very explicit rules for things like answering the telephone. So, somebody would call our house. We made them practice. Hello, Whitfield residents. How may I help you? And then they had to write down a message on a pink pad. Because that's a part of the gig. If they don't write it down, we don't know who called. Right, so we had to practice, we had rules. Who called? Somebody. Did you write down the message? No. <laughs> well, that's not okay. Like, <laughs> we, gotta, we gotta get that right. Like, we had explicit rules. There are also implicit rules, things that grow up over time. My daughter is very emotive. Whatever she is feeling, you will be feeling too. Which is great. I mean, I'm telling you, she's one of the most amazing human beings on the planet. However, when she's having a bad day, everybody's having a bad day. We learned over time to just leave her alone. Don't try to fix it. Fixing it makes it worse. We didn't like get together and make a rule. We just learned over time, that's the rule. You have implicit and explicit rules where you work, in our community. The rule is what is enforced, not what's said. There's a number on the speed limit sign it says like 50. The rule is whatever they will actually pull you over for, which probably isn't 50, it probably isn't 51, right? Like we know that there's an implicit other thing that's happening. Sometimes the rule is being enforced differently on, other, on different people. That is the rule. The rule is we enforce the rules differently on other people, on different people. That becomes, that is the rule. Okay, let's keep going. John, you did a good thing. Thank you. So this applies to all social systems. It applies to families, it applies to teams, it applies to companies, it applies to societies. Like this is, a system is simply a way of describing the people, relationships, and rules that are in play in any one place. It's just a description of a natural phenomenon. It's a term to describe it. Now, let's talk a little, bit, a little bit about how systems are designed. This is an image of a pair of right-hand scissors. They're not just scissors. Because in my nuclear family, when I grew up, there were four of us. Half of us were right-handed, half of us were left-handed, which meant that there was no such things as just scissors. Because you can't cut paper using right-hand scissors in your left hand. You can't do it. The paper folds, it doesn't cut. So when I was growing up, I asked, in my house, I was like, where are the right-hand scissors? And my mom would say, they're there. I went to kindergarten, I asked my teacher, where are the right-hand scissors? She said, the scissors are right there. I said, okay, but where are the right-hand scissors? And she said, the scissors are right there. I was like, this lady is not qualified to teach me. Because most systems are designed around whatever is predominant in the system, right? So. Right-hand scissors are scissors, and then we have left-hand scissors. Right, whatever is predominant is what the system's designed around, and then there are outsiders. At best, we make accommodations for them by having a different kind of pair of scissors someplace else. At worst, we don't actually make even accommodations for them. We tell them, you just gotta figure out how to do the thing that the predominant people do. We know a person 
who failed kindergarten. Because part of getting out of kindergarten is your ability to cut scissors, use scissors. And they didn't have left-hand scissors for him. So he's being evaluated on how successful he can be using a tool that is not designed for him. And then he is the person who fails. Back to DeShane's point. Is the problem that this kid can't use scissors? No. The problem is we have a system that's designed around predominance that doesn't give him a pair of left-hand scissors. And the person who, is, who failed in that environment is the kid. Scissors, left-hand scissors. Americans, African Americans. People, people with disabilities. We have predominance, and then we have outsiders. Here's the thing, left-hand people die at a higher rate because so many things are not designed for them. They die because of, of, of accidents and injury at a much higher rate than right-hand people. We were doing this talk someplace, at a place that is a, um, has a giant garden, and the, at the end somebody said, oh, I realize we don't have a left-hand chainsaw. Le left-hand people die at a higher rate, not because there's something wrong with left-hand people, it's because the system is designed around predominance. DeShane talked about the fact that indigenous people in Montana have higher health disparities, less likely to have insurance. Not because there's something wrong with them, because we have a system that's designed around predominance. The default blood pressure for black people in the United States is higher. The expected blood pressure is higher for black people in the United States. In the medical books, even though there's zero gene that can determine whether a person is black or not, that gene doesn't exist. There is no biological marker for black. There is people walking around in dark colored skin, and the research says that the default effects of racism raises the default blood pressure of black people. And they die at a higher rate. Not because there's some biological difference, but because we design systems around predominance. And then we don't, either we don't make accommodations or the accommodations are not good enough. One of the things that's frustrating about this is that universal design scissors exist and they cost about the same. And yet in almost any corporate place that you go today, you will still find primarily right-hand scissors. So then let's talk about how you analyze systems. You have the boundary of the system, right? The people in the system. And then you have the inner circle of the system. This is simply the place in the system that has the authority and influence to make and set the rules in the system including the rules for what it takes to get into the inner circles. Any system that you think of, whether it's the board of directors or the executive team or city council or, like that's where your inner circle is. And there's concentric rings of inner circle. Because then you have the people in the margins, sorry, the system margin that are farther away from the inner circle, right? So if you think about it in concentric rings, you have the people that are farthest away, you move closer and closer and closer to the inner circles. In most systems, whatever is socially predominant in that system is what you will find in the inner circle of that system. In most systems, there is an overlap. Certainly systems that are designed around predominance, there's an overlap between what is socially predominant in that system and the inner circles of that system. Which means that 
there's an overlap between whatever, it's the, whatever the social margins are and people in the margins of that system. Now, in some ways, that just makes sense. There's more right-hand people, more than will be in the inner circle. Let's talk about some dynamics of predominant design systems. Success is an expectation to move further and further into the inner circle. Typically, right, if you get hired in the margins, like as frontline staff, you make it all the way to the executive team or the board, that's typically described as you have been successful in that system. That's sort of the default definition of success. Institutions, rules, structured rules, are gatekeepers for being able to move along to the inner circle. So again, if you're thinking about an organization, you have HR rules, who gets hired, and then who gets promoted, how do they get make, move to the next rung? If you move into a community, like you want to go to a good school, if you do well in primary school, high school, you can go to a good college. But those institutions determine whether you take the next step. Again, I'm not saying that that's inherently bad, I'm just describing the way that systems function. And there are compound effects. The farther away one is from the inner circle, the harder it is to move inward. Because there's more accommodations that need to be made and or more ways that a person needs to deal with whatever is predominant without those accommodations. So that's a quick, if you want to look at systems that you work in, live in, it's a quick way of thinking about analyzing your system. Where is the inner circle? What's socially predominant in the system? Where is, the, is there overlap in those two things? Where are the margins? It's a way of understanding the way systems work. Something to understand, though, see, y'all don't live in Seattle like we do, is a common image. And what's to know is that this is not the effect of a broken system. This is the way the system is actually designed. We don't have a system that's broken because it has traffic jams. We have a system that has traffic jams. There's this idea, it's called the myth of the broken system in systems thinking. There is no such thing as dysfunction in a system. Every system is perfectly aligned to produce its current results. It's producing the results it's aligned to produce. The reason we say it's not broken is because you can't just go in and fix one part of the system and fix it. You have to rethink the way the system is designed. So as we're doing this Jedi work, we gotta be thinking about what do we gotta do at the systems level in order to make sure that this works. Now, some of the effects of systems are not just what we see in real time. Some of them are effects that are compounded over time. So there's a concept called generational monopoly. So let's say three generations ago, our grandparents were playing a game of monopoly. Classically, when you pass go, you're supposed to get 200 bucks. Three generations ago, our grandparents are paying, playing. One set of grandparents, whenever somebody gets to go, they punch them in the mouth and take their $200. That's pretty much what was happening three generations ago. Two generations ago, Right? The next generation. Next generation says, hey, I don't know why my parents punched your parents in the mouth and didn't let you collect your $200. That's crazy. I feel terrible about that. We're not going to do that to you. When you pass go, you can get $200, just like I do. However, you can't own Park Place, Boardwalk, half the properties on the board you just cannot own. You get your $200, though, and I promise I will not punch you in the mouth. 
That's pretty much what was happening one generation ago. And then you get to the next generation. And they say, I do not know why my parents punched you, like, didn't let you buy property. That's terrible. I'm so sorry. When you pass go, you can collect $200. You can buy whatever property that you want that's left to buy with the money that you can now get, even though we have had three generations in order to build up money to buy property at a different rate, and we now have property that you can't get your hands on because we already own it. But hey, let's call it good. We're not doing those things that those people in those two generations ago were doing. We're even now, right? Like, we have to think about systems not just in the here and now. We have to think about it. What has happened over time? Sometimes when people show up angry, it isn't because of what you specifically did. And it's not that they're blaming you for doing it. But it doesn't take away the compound effect of the things that have happened. And if I love somebody, I'm not going to ignore that pain. I'm not saying that you have to give away boardwalk. Like, I'm not saying that. I am saying that it's not okay to just ignore the pain. We're not doing that to you anymore. Why are you so upset? You personally didn't experience that. Your grandparents did. Why are you so upset? Because we're still living with the effects. So Missoula isn't just Missoula today. Missoula exists today because of Missoula yesterday and the day before and the day before. So as we think about the system, we have people, relationships, and rules, and the effects of those things over time. Now, it's okay. Let's do this. So this is an image that was pretty common in what we typically refer to as the Jim Crow era in the United States. And I want you to imagine two people, a black person and a white person, arriving at these two faucets at the same time. Let's say both of them are really good people. They are, there's not a bigot among them. And the black person says, hey, why don't you go first? Have your water first. And the white person says, oh, no, no, you go first. I'm happy to wait. You can, you can get the water first. Like, the two human beings may be very, very kind to one another in the moment, but we can't ignore the structure in which that interaction, interaction is happening. This is the difference between bigotry, acting with hate towards one another based upon some sort of social category, and systemic marginalization. The system is marginalizing. So the fact that the person in the moment is saying, I'm not marginalizing, but we're in a system that is marginalizing, that then becomes the work. Yes, do the work to become a good person. Being a good person is good. And some of the barriers that people see have to do with the way the system marginalizes them that you may or may not actually see. Or you do see, but can't see what the problem is. There is a classic experiment where you ask guys, what did they do to arrive here safely today? What steps did they take? What'd you do? Well, you know, I locked my car. Uh, I left on time. Tried not to drive too fast. And then you ask women, what did you do to arrive safely here today? Much longer list. 
checked behind me when I was walking, kept my keys poised, made sure I had some sort of mace or something else in my purse. Like there's a whole universe of activities that many women have to go through in order to keep themselves safe. That most men are completely oblivious to. There are systemic disparities that because most men don't experience them, they are completely invisible to us. I had a friend of mine say, why is it that when I try to explain racism to people who haven't experienced racism, they tell me that I'm not experiencing racism? She's like, it's like I'm having a heart attack and I'm describing the symptoms of my heart attack. And someone will say, well, I've never had a heart attack, so you can't be having a heart attack. I've never had that experience. You can't be having that experience. Are you sure it's not just indigestion? Are you sure it's not something else? Love does not ignore the pain. That is their experience. So then what's Jedi got to do with equity? Justice, most of us have sort of an idea of what that means. Diversity, most of us have like an idea of what that means. Inclusion, most of us have an idea of what that means. It's the equity part that tends to be squishy. So what we found is that the clearest way to describe what equity is, and this is consistent with the definitions uh, that are in the resolutions of the city and the county, is to think about, about it in the same way that you think about it in other ways. So let me unpack this a little bit. Let's start with an inequitable system. We would say the system is inequitable because there's concentrated ability to set and evolve the rules in the system. That what was socially predominant is now dominant because the inner circle has created rules that make it more difficult for people in the margins to move towards the inner circle. That means the people in the margins are not just in the margins, they're being marginalized. The example that I tend to give, we're in a lovely university here, I know, I'm pretty sure you don't have this rule, hopefully I'm not offending anybody here, but if you are, I'm sorry. Um, Ivy League schools, I believe, still have a rule called legacy. Meaning that if your people in your family, your parents or grandparents graduated from that Ivy League school, you get a leg up, you're basically guaranteed admission. Given the history of who attended those schools, the people who are being guaranteed admission look a lot like what the inner circle was in that school years ago. So it makes it much more likely that what was socially predominant remains in the inner circle over time. Now, that rule doesn't say only black people or only white people. It's, all it has to say is it's legacy. Because the vast majority of people who went to that school were white and of a certain social economic class. That's not predominance. That's dominance. That's making it less likely that people from the margins can, in fact, participate and find their way to the inner circle. We would say a system is equitable when there's shared ability for setting and evolving the rules in the system among people who are uh, socially predominant and people in the social margins. That doesn't mean that we think that there's no, rule, no role for inner circles, no role for authority and influence. There is, like you need a board of directors, you need an executive team, you need a city council. However, equitable systems ensure that the rules for getting on city council and the executive team have been developed by people in the margins as well as people who are socially predominant. So what do we mean by equity? This is where most people run into this word first, is related to their house or someone's house. So if a person has a house worth 500,000, the bank or mortgage company owns 300,000, we describe what's left as their equity. 
The word equity is used in situations where there is multiple owners. The bank is an owner and the person buying the house is an owner. That's where the term equity is primarily used. The same is true in the stock market. Multiple people buy shares of ownership in the same company. They have equity shares in the company. So the term equity, when you remove it from sort of the Jedi space, means spaces where there's shared ownership. Now this is super critical for several reasons. One of which being that we gotta understand that's what equity is from a Jedi standpoint. We're trying to get people who currently are not bought in to have the ability to buy in. And when you buy a stock in the stock market, it gives you the ability to help determine the rules because it gives you a vote for the people in the inner circle, the board of directors. That's how equity works. Now we can talk about whether or not that works really well in the stock market, but that's the concept behind it, is when you buy in, you get to help set direction. You get to, you get to weigh in, you have ownership. You don't just pay, you don't just contribute. That's a donation. You get no equity for a donation. Frequently, that's what we're doing. We're asking people in the margins to donate, but not to have any equity. Now, one of the reasons that this is so important is because there are some folks who think that this Jedi stuff is like Marxist. I'm on a college campus. I am sure there are great debates about the pros and cons of Marxism versus capitalism. We're not doing that today. But what this is not, like we use the concept of equity in the United States all day, every day. This is a basic concept in the United States. Equi equity is shared ownership. That's what it means. It means to have people buy in. And once they buy in, they get some say so. And the reason we do it is to increase value. My friend Dakota still here? Dakota and I had a thought experiment earlier today where she and I had a company. It's called the Dakota James Company. She was the driving force, so she had 75% of the company, I had 25%. We were doing great. Our thought experiment, we had a $10 million company. Like, we were doing great. She was quick to point out that means that she's worth 7.5 million and I'm worth less than that. I'm okay with that. If we took our company to the stock market because we wanted to grow, people can buy shares. We can blow up, get really big maybe a hundred million dollar company. But we have to sell some shares of ownership to do it. We don't get to continue to be 100% owners of that company. Other people have to buy in. And when they buy in, they get some say over what we're trying to do. That is what equity is. That is, the same thing is true with your house. If you got $200,000 doing nothing, like, first of all, come see me. You got $200,000 doing nothing, right? That's Dakota and I want you to buy into our company. No, kidding. So if you got $200,000 doing nothing, right? You can do whatever you want to with that money until you buy a house with it. Then you can't. You have more value. You've turned the $200,000 that you have into a $500,000 house. You've increased the value dramatically. But you don't still get to do everything you want with that 200 bucks. Now the co-owner, the bank, has some say-so over what you can do with that money. Th this is, any time equity is at use, this is how it works. This is what equity actually is. It is not taking some predetermined pie and trying to slice off more and more people for people in the margins, like, let's give you some gifts. It is about buy-in to increase value. You have people in your community who want to help. They want to buy in. They want to increase the value of this place. We have to offer them equity, a way to buy in, and some say over what's actually happening to them. 
So we're gonna look at an example that's super popular in terms of describing the difference between equality and equity. This is a pretty common thing in Jedi circles. And so on the one side, it says equality because everybody has the same number of boxes. And on this side, it said equity because everybody can see over the fence. The key is we can't tell just by looking at this, these images whether image B is equity because equity is in the process. It is in the process of defining what is our definition of success and what are the barriers that we see it, that we have to overcome to reach that success. If someone were to walk up to the people with those three boxes in image A who own the boxes and said, hey, I think the way you all are standing isn't good. I'm going to change those boxes and move them to image B, the folks in image A don't have any say because it's not their boxes. If they are their boxes and somebody else comes along and says, you gotta move these boxes, that's not cool. And if you ask the folks in image B when somebody else moved their boxes for them, is that a better outcome? They might even say yes. The question is, is their definition of success looking over the fence in the first place? Like, the shortest person in image A, like, they're looking through the fence. To my mind, the story I'm telling myself is that they lost their baseball. He wants to get his baseball back so they can go play baseball instead of watch a baseball game. Like, you may have seen other versions of this where there, there's no fence or they're sitting in the stands because we don't know their definition of success. Equity is in coming to a shared definition of success. Within the context of a system, which can be people that live in our community, and understanding what are the barriers that I see, what are the barriers that you see that we need to collaborate together to overcome in order to reach that success. So there's some terms that get used pretty interchangeably, but I wanna sort of unpack them a bit, right? We talk about Jedi. So diversity is difference. We've talked about equity, it's shared ownership. Inclusion can either be melting pot, we're gonna include you in what we are doing. Or we're gonna partner with you, we're inviting you in to be a partner. The difference between those two things is equity. If they have no equity, the inclusion is we are deciding what your experience is going to be. Come on in, you're welcome to, to join us to have the experience that we are defining for you. Being pro-equity means they get to be partners in helping to define what that experience is going to be. Justice. Are we imposing a definition of justice on people? Or are we co-defining what fairness means? Being pro-equity means that we're gonna co-define what fairness means. Fairness, woo, it's a big one. Unfortunately, what one person thinks is fair rarely is what the, what the next person thinks is fair. And so we can easily have the inner circle impose a definition of fairness. We are telling you this is fair. Equity means making sure we're including people in the margins to define what fair is. Again, we're not asking them to tell us, like we're not delegating that responsibility, we're saying this is a shared work. Let me be clear, like this is what's hard about this work, is we gotta be in that hard work of working together to come up with what is our definition of fair? What is our definition of success? What are the barriers that you see that I may not see? Here are things that I see that you may not see. That's the work. Once you sort those things out, the action steps that you take are much clearer. So 
So, I mentioned I've been married for a long time. If you are like me, some of the hardest conversations you've had, the most difficult, maybe enraging discussions you've ever had is with a person who is very close to you, like a spouse or a significant other, maybe a sibling, a parent. And you gotta work it out. That's hard. Doing this work is hard. Shared ownership is hard. Me putting my hand on my shoulder, I mean on my hip and saying, no, we're gonna do it my way. Or my wife saying the same thing, no, we're gonna do it my way. It's much more straightforward. But where's the love in that? It's hard. The tension is where the love is. The tension, being willing to stay in the tension to sort it out, that's where the love is. So what's Jedi got to do with Missoula? Well, first I wanna make sure that we pay attention to who has brought us to this moment. There are so many people who worked tirelessly to get us to today. And I don't just mean this summit, but the summit is awesome. I mean passing Jedi resolutions in the county and the city, building a Jedi network, having hard conversations with people, being willing to identify the needs of people in the margins. This is not the start of the work in Missoula. The work's been happening here for a long time. This is a moment in time where hopefully we can turn a corner and keep going, go even bigger. But Jedi is real in Missoula because people here made it real. One of the most insidious things about issues of uh, systemic marginalization is that we tend to only see the ways in which we're in the margins and not the ways in which we are in the inner circles. Other people are looking at you going, I'm in the margins, and they perceive you as in the inner circle. And you're going, but, but I'm in the margins in this way, and this other person's in the inner circle in this other way. Like, we got to pick the systems we're in, where we have the ability to engage. Whether we're in the margins or in the inner circles of those systems, it's about shared ownership in that system. We cannot let the fact that other people seem to have more influence than us, more power than us, to let us to get in the way of our ability to do the work. We got to do that here in Missoula. I know y'all probably think that there's somebody back at, at home or where you work or at City Hall or someplace else who is more in the inner circle. That's probably true. However, you are more in the inner circle than someone else. And that's where the opportunity lies. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about politics. I mean, it's been a very brief period of time. But what I want to say about it is the politics are bad right now. I'm not telling you something you don't know. The politics are bad right now. It's hard. And what we need to understand is the politics are about real people. Regardless of where you are on the ideological spectrum, the other person on the other side who's acting in a way that you think is completely insane, that's a real person. The behavior that you're seeing, that is pain. 
that is a person in pain. Love says we don't ignore their pain. We may not agree with the reason that they're in pain. We may think that the reason that they're in pain is completely made up, but we can't ignore the pain. So I don't know what you're going to do about the politics, but what I want to encourage you to do is, in Missoula, let's make sure that we don't overlook our political opponent's pain. That we respond to them in ways that are consistent with our values. My highest value is love. Any white supremacist on the planet, any person on the planet who is an active member of the KKK, my love for them is what makes me want to help them not live in that fear and pain. I want them to stop being afraid because I love them. I don't agree with them, but I'm willing to sit in the, in the heat of it to help them figure out how to get out of the pain. Because not only is that good for me, it's good for them. The pain is bad. Because that's my value. If I respond to somebody else according to their values, I'm living according to their values. When they come at me with their values, my only option is to respond with my values. There are real people on the other side of those politics. And I know they make you crazy. I understand. But loving Missoula means loving the people of Missoula. Loving Missoula doesn't just mean loving the buildings, although that airport is nice. Airport is nice. Library, nice. Loving Missoula means loving the people of Missoula, especially the ones that don't agree with you, especially the ones that don't get it, especially the ones that seem to be making you crazy. They're as much Missoula as you are Missoula. That's why we got to get into it with them to figure out what is our shared definition of success. You see some barriers that I may not see. I see some things that you may not see. We have to do the work to figure out how we're going to overcome those barriers together. One of the ways that that's going to happen is something called the Missoula Community Equity Convening. It'll be kicked off, I think, on the heels of the conference that's happening tomorrow, headed up by the head of the um, Public Health Department and the United Way a series of conversations bringing people to the table to say, what do we got to do to build a shared definition of success? What are the barriers that we see? What is the plan to move forward on those things? That's what's happening here in Missoula. Which leads me to ending where I started. Thank you, Missoula. Thank you for being the kind of place that would have those kinds of convenings. Thank you for being the kind of place that would have Jedi resolutions at the city and the county. Thank you for being the kind of place that's willing to pay attention to the systems that are at play. Thank you for being the kind of place that's willing to look at the history that's brought us here. Thank you for being the kind of people who, as Deshane said earlier, are willing to show up. You have something amazing here. Now is not the time to rock back on your heels and say it's getting too hard. Now is the time to lean in, double down, say, I got you. No matter how upset and frustrated I am, I got you. Because I love you. Because I love Missoula. You have an opportunity here that many places will never see. They'll never see it until you show them how to see it. 
Let's make sure that what we do in Missoula shows the way. We got this. You got this. Because you love Missoula. So let's love the people that are in it. Thank you very much. I think we have some time for some questions. So, oh, sorry. Uh, Devin, Devin is gonna run around with the microphone. So raise your hand and he'll... There are no, there are no questions? Hi, thanks a lot for coming and speaking. Um, I've got a question. So you're talking about um, identities like intersecting. And so say, say you're in the inner circle in one identity but not in another, and you see somebody being disempowered, how do you decide how to step in for that person and represent them in the inner circle without being patronizing? You know what I mean? Yep, I do. Okay. So. Um, Step one, recognize that we are in the inner circles someplace, and that it's part of our responsibility to look out for people in the margins. Our job, though, as you pointed out, is not to save them. Our job is not to move the boxes for them. Our job is to ask them what help I might be able to provide. Sometimes the worst thing you can do for someone is bring attention to the ways in which they're being marginalized in the moment. They got enough stuff going on, they're trying to manage themselves, but you can't know that unless you have a relationship and you talk to them. However, you can make sure that at an inner circle level, we have some equity processes to ensure that people in the margins are helping to define what the rules actually are. So there's an individual piece of the equation to ask them, Again, maybe not in the moment, circle back later if need be. Or if something's violating your values, you don't have to do it on behalf of them, do it on behalf of yourself. Right, like if something's violating your values, you get to step in. Don't do it on their behalf. Like somebody's telling, a, the classic example, somebody's telling a joke that's not appropriate, don't say, I don't think you should tell that joke because James is here. Right? If you don't think they should tell those jokes, you gotta say that on your behalf. I don't want to be around people telling those jokes. Then James doesn't have to speak up, it's a different issue. So that's at the interpersonal level. Then there's at the structural level. Why are we in a place where those jokes are allowed in the first place? Who do we gotta talk to to make sure that the rules are set so that that's not okay and individual people aren't the ones that have to point that out? And do we have a mechanism to make sure people in the margins are a part of defining what happens in this space? That's at the structural level. And that's a role, again, in the inner circle that we can create opportunities to make sure that that happens. Well, the, um, they're, they're recording, and uh, people in the back may not be able to hear you. I can certainly hear you, but. So uh, your Monopoly uh, reference stuck with me um, because there's a lot of pain there. And if we think about justice and co-defining fairness and, um, and love not in ignoring the pain, can you speak to anything that's going on right now around that type of fairness where three generations of getting punched in the mouth and not getting the $200? Well, I don't want to overstate, but I think that that's part of what Missoula is trying to figure out. Like if the conversations I was having with staff earlier today are an indication, that's part of what they're trying to sort out. It's like, let's make sure we get to a definition of success that actually ensures that everybody gets what they need. And we have to recognize that some people are gonna need different things given the generational nature of marginalization. 
So I, again, I don't want to. I don't want to say everything's hunky dory and rosy and easy. I am saying my understanding is that's why we're here. That's why we're in this summit, is to start to figure that out. And in those convenings that I mentioned, that's part of where they're trying to build the plans for addressing those things. Anything nationally or anything that you can see that could help or that's going to support us as we define that future. So the question was, is there anything nationally that's going on? Nationally that's going on. There's lots of things that are nationally going on. However, most of what's happening nationally is so caught up in the national politics that it's hard for me to imagine that it's going to be super helpful in the short term. I've always been a person, even though I worked at the federal level, that believes that, it's a silly saying, but communities are the experiment beds of democracy. Like, this is where we figure things out. And when we figure it out in local communities, then other communities follow along, and eventually that becomes a national movement. It's rare that it happens the other way. There's plenty of national organizations that might be able to help with like resources and information, but I don't know. There's not a lot of people at a national level that are operating at scale. Missoula is trying to do this at a city and county level, which is a pretty significant scale relative to other things that are happening around the country. So here's the good news and the bad news. Y'all are leading the way. There's just not a lot of people you can look to who are doing it differently and better. There are other county governments that are doing cool things, or like, but to do this at a community level in the way that Missoula is taking it on in the moment, there are other people who are doing it. They're, it's going to be different in every place, and Missoula is at a, a different kind of tipping point than a lot, of other a lot of other places are right now. So there's a hand here, here, and then over. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We are past, so let's do maybe one or are two Are we more. past? Oh, my bad, Devin. Uh, just to add and respond to stepping in and trying to make justice or fairness for someone on someone's behalf, I like the approach of asking how can I be of help, which, um, and, and in, in sort of coupling what you have mentioned, uh, Jayton, um, about the generations of being punched in the mouth. Uh, it's important to mention and to know when you mention that Missoula is launching a lot of good things and it's going to be working out things to move Jedi forward. It's important to acknowledge that they are moving forward and one of the big benefits of being in Missoula and a part of this movement is that some of this have already been done with Learn community, with Learn Missoula. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you've heard of Learn yeah, Missoula, absolutely. but that's a research study that was recently completed and will be published shortly. And it's important to note that because a group of people are not just getting in a room coming up with ideas of what to make how to make a difference. What it is, is uh, a research program study where the BIPOC, black indigenous people of color, got uh, interviewed, talked with, talked to, and conversed, and came up with the ideas of what does justice looks like in Missoula, what does equity looks like in Missoula. So it's coming directly from the source that wants to see it happen. So it is a good step, it's a good movement, but again, I just want to somewhat reiterate to ensure that people are not getting in rooms, convening conferences and, and, and meetings to come up with ideas that the Learn Missoula project have already done its research and published its findings to bypass that study. Absolutely, thank you so much for saying that. Uh, it's one of the great ways that the people in the margins of this community have been listened to already. And so that'll be a big piece of what comes next. Like it's built upon the input of people in the margins here in Missoula. So thank you for pointing that out, I appreciate it. Okay, I didn't realize I was over. So we're gonna do two really quick ones and then we're gonna be done. Okay, my quick question is, um, 
when it comes to your organization, Be Kind, uh, what is uh, a struggle that you can speak to when it comes to being a Jedi, and how did you overcome that? Uh, well, the, as Devin is walking the, the mic over to the other piece, I would say the hardest thing, there's two most difficult things about it. I'll, I'll go in reverse order. The, one of them is I have to stay true to my values in the face of people who are not acting in ways that are consistent with my values. So I seem like a super nice guy standing up here. I got fire in my soul. Like, I can light up. <laughs> and that's not helpful. And it's difficult when someone's coming at me to remember, oh, James, you are trying to demonstrate what love looks like in the face of people acting crazy to you. That's hard. I will not say I've overcome it. It's a constant battle. I get up every day. And I, you know, again, I'm not trying to impose my thing on other people. What I got to do is I have to read my Bible. I have to pray. I have to remind myself that sacrifice is a part of my faith tradition. And so it is an opportunity for me to sacrifice for love in that moment. I have to remind myself of that every day. The other thing is, it's really hard to convince people that unity is a thing anymore. I got no examples. It used to be like, hey, you know like your family, how you'd never walk away from your family? People are like, I'm not seeing those people at Thanksgiving ever again. <laughs> right? Like, we have, as a, like a, a society, we've lost examples of what it means to just be in the heat with someone no matter what, Till you figure it out because that's and again I, I mean no disrespect I understand sometimes you got to not see your family members because they're harmful like I'm not it's not like I don't understand why those examples don't exist anymore it's just they don't and so I'm I'm standing all the time trying to be like you know how unity is a thing and people are like what you know how you just hang in there no matter what because it's hard they're like what why would you do that in my TED talk I say do you realize that the preamble to the U.S. Constitution says, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union, the first lines of the U.S. Constitution are about unity. It is to create a union among people who are disparate. That is what the document exists to do. It's the first line. And look at the politicians that are out here right now. It would seem like, it has no, like that has nothing to do with why we actually created this country. Now, I'm not saying this country hasn't had problems. I'm not even saying that when they wrote that, they meant all the things they said in there. But that's what the thing says. And, it, and it's hard to get people to, like, to even find an example of where you just hang in there no matter what to figure it out. So I would say that's the other hard thing. All right, our last uh, one. You actually already answered her question. So awesome. I'm going to hand it back over to Samuel to round us out here. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Okay, could we give James another round of applause? Thank you again to all of our sponsors, including Clearwater Credit Union, lead sponsor in DJ&A Engineering. A special thank you to Denise for interpreting, Denise and Brandy for interpreting this event, and to MCAT for recording this session and making it widely available for future viewing. Thank you all for being here tonight, and we look forward to seeing many of you at the summit tomorrow, which will begin right here on the third floor of the UC, beginning at 8 a.m. with check-in. We hope to see you all tomorrow. Have a great night.